an initiative that ECMI started uh, five years ago in 2016, uh, aiming to promote uh, research in the area of capital markets, of European capital markets and their functioning. For this year, we received around 22 submissions uh, coming from uh, all over the world, from Europe, Germany, Italy, France, Spain, Belgium, uh, but also from the US, Australia, Hong Kong, uh, Canada, Indonesia, India, and many other countries. Submissions mainly from PhD students, young economists, young professionals, academics, regulators, and, and policy makers, but also from industry and market participants and experts. Uh, the papers received, uh, they are going through two blind uh, reviewing rounds uh, assessed by the academic committee. And uh, at this point, I would like to thank uh, the academic committee members, the chair, Andrei Kivlenko, the vice chair, Florencio Lopez de Silanes, but also the members, Jesper Lohansen, Alistair Milne, Marie Birier, and Chris Good. Uh, but also, I would like to uh, special thank uh, Franklin Allen and the Bleven Howard uh, Center for Financial Analysis at the Imperial Business School for their support. Uh, they are loyal partners of ECMI annual conference for many years now, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank them. Uh, thank also those who already uh, participating via this Zoom link. Uh, to this session or uh, watching us live uh, via the SEPS YouTube channel. Uh, just to remind you uh, that at the bottom of your screen, you have a Q&A function. You can post your questions there during the session and Franklin will make sure and to pass them to uh, Tarek. I would like to welcome Tarek and congratulate him for the uh, paper, for the best prize. It's a very interesting paper and looking forward to uh, the presentation. And with no further uh, delay, I would pass the floor to Franklin, who will moderate the discussion. Please, Franklin. Thank you, Apostolos. We're very happy at the Brevin Howard Center to uh, help uh, organize this conference and uh, be involved with it and sponsor it. I think it's a very important annual event. European capital markets are extremely important and hopefully uh, this conference will cont contribute to uh, the capital markets union. And as we get through the next few months, hopefully that will become more and more important part of the current uh, uh, Brussels um, EU commission agenda. I'd like to th also thank the committee for doing such a great job in choosing the winner. And I'm very pleased uh, they did a, chose a wonderful paper by um, uh, Marco Derrico and Tariq Rupni. And it's on an important topic, which is netting essentially. It's about compressing over the counter markets. And what, what we know is over-the-counter markets have lots of exposures and often they're multiple ones between bilateral people. But also if you look through the whole network, there's huge potential for reducing it. And what, what this paper does a very nice job of is looking at that and seeing how you can compress, and that's what compress means essentially, reduce the exposures. And I think it's a very important from a whole range of things, from financial stability reasons to uh, efficiency of the markets and so on. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Tariq, who's got about 20 minutes to present the paper, and then we'll have a Q&A session. Please feel free to start writing uh, questions in the Q&A function as we go through. And so when we finish, we can start on those. Tariq, I hand the floor over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Franklin. Um, can, can you guys see my screen? Yes. OK. All right. So thank you very much um, to everyone. So thank you very much. Um, for the invitation. It's a great honor and great privilege to be given the opportunity to present this work. 
thank you very much, Apostolos. Thank you very much, the selection committee and the organizers. And thank you very much, Franklin, for um, moderating this session. I think I checked and all my chapters from my PhD thesis mentioned papers from, from you as it was related to networks. So it's, a, it's really great to, to get the privilege of having you moderating this session. So this is joint work with Marco De Rico, my dear friend, who's a um, financial stability expert at the European Systemic Risk Board. And basically the story <clears throat> of our paper is the story of a technology and the capacity, the potential capacity of this financial technology to transform the anatomy of financial markets and in particular over the counter markets. So over the counter markets are important for the economy, in particular derivatives market are, have a huge importance for the economy, but they've also had a crucial role during the crisis. And when you look at their evolution, so here I plot the evolution of their size uh, over time since 1998, the first thing that stands out is that they are huge markets. So here we're talking in terms of orders of, in the orders of hundreds of, hundreds of trillions of dollars of notional um, related to those markets. But the second thing that is striking with those markets is that they also exhibit large swings in values. So from one quarter to the next, you can have thousands of trillions of dollars that evaporate and then come back and evaporate again. And this becomes even more striking as you zoom down into some specific segments of, um, of markets. So here we do the same plot, but we focus on credit default swaps over the counter market. And again, you see this large increase between 2004 and 2008, and then a steady decrease from 2008 onward, going from around 60 trillion to almost 10 trillion today. And so the starting point of our research question was, what is driving this reduction? Because you know, one intuitive um, answer to this question would be that this is driven by activity. And so it just means that participants have stopped trading in those markets or participants are leaving those markets. And so this would suggest that liquidity is running down and then inventory capacities are, are stocked up or are limited, et cetera. And instead, what we want to explore today is an alternative ex explanation, an alternative story, which um, would indicate that actually those changes are not due to specifically to change in activity, in trading activity, but they're due to the adoption of a technology. And if that story holds true, then the implications are tending to the opposite direction, which means then they would imply an increase in liquidity and an increase in inventory management capacities. And so there's been a few reports and a few indicators going in this direction. And for example, here in, a, in an article covering work by the BIS in the Financial Times, it was mentioned that um, banks had turned to this technology called portfolio compression, as Franklin mentioned, and, and you know, assigned them as a key driver of this falling outstanding notional that we were observing in those markets. So before we talk about the implications, let me uh, basically illustrate what, what Franklin had, had correctly described as being a portfolio compression. So ultimately, in a nutshell, portfolio compression is a posture technology that aims at reducing gross positions of market participants while maintaining net balances equal. So if you were to observe a market, and so here you can consider, <clears throat> you know, for example, a credit default swap contract, credit default swap contract written on the same reference entity with the same maturity, and you observe these outstanding positions between different participants, then you can always compute, look at their net positions and then look at their gross positions. And then at the market level, you simply sum up all these notional. And so these 14, 40, 50, 40, 45 units here correspond to the 60 trillion and the 700 trillion we were seeing before. And so what portfolio compression aims to do is try and find rearrangements of the network of outstanding positions in order to reduce gross positions while keeping the net um, column constant. And so uh, let me, and, and so one thing to notice here is that this exercise is by definition a multilateral exercise because every participant only knows about the trades in which they're directly involved in. And so you require the intervention of a third party who's going to collect all this information, reconstruct the network and then identify solutions. And so, for example, in this case, one solution would be to terminate the contract between A and B, then adjust uh, accordingly the contracts between B and C and C and A. And with this market resulting market, what you look, what you have is that the net positions are equal to what you, we had before, but now on the gross dimension, A, B, and C have reduced their position by five units each. So at the market level now we have 30 units. So we have a reduction of about 15 units 
without having changed anything economically uh, uh, significant. So, you know, if you were to observe this, uh, we haven't removed any participants from the, from the market. We haven't stopped any uh, trading activity from the market. We have just touched upon the post-trade positions. Now, there are two remarks that I want to push here uh, before we, we move on. One is that, and this is a, a, a something that I will try and formalize later on, is if we've been able to compress those markets, it means that those markets ex ante exhibit some kind of redundancy that we can exploit. And so it's important before we talk about portfolio compression that we're able to formalize this, this redundancy that portfolio compression aims to eliminate. The second thing is that <clears throat> ultimately, as Franklin mentioned, portfolio compression is a multilateral netting technique. And we've been, you know, many markets have been using multilateral netting techniques, but the most standard way of achieving multilateral netting is via the introduction of a central clearinghouse or a central counterparty, which will then require all trades to be novated and pushed into the central clearinghouse. So here, what I want to make clear is that what portfolio compression manages to achieve is this multilateral netting um, uh, uh, technique without requiring the introduction of a new node in the system and without everything is decentralized basically and you only exploit already established um, um, relationships between the participants. All right, so taking stock of what we are observing today, this, this technology is actually very well in demand. So the pioneer um, company servicing this technology is called Trioptima. Uh, and they're leading the market. And according to their website, they've been able to eliminate more than $1.8 quadrillion of notional since they started in 2003. But what is important and what they report as well is that basically their business boomed around 2009 and 2010. And this also leads us to why do banks and other participants engage in portfolio compression? And so there are many candidate reasons and many incentives to do so, but by far the most important one, according to recent report by the Financial Stability Board, is the change in regulation. So in the post-crisis reform efforts, changes to the regulation have brought in capital and collateral requirements that became more stringent, whose computation is based, includes gross positions in over-the-counter derivatives market. So as a result, banks that engage in portfolio compression are basically able to alleviate some of these regulatory costs because they are reducing their gross position without changing anything on the net. And basically they're able to deleverage without having to sell any asset or inject any more capital. So ultimately, this regulatory change has boomed the demand for the, for the service. And from a global, let's say, regulatory perspective, there is a generic support for the adoption of this technology. So both in the US and in the EU, um, the European Market Infrastructure Regulation and Dodd-Frank both sponsor um, the adoption and the use of this technology to reduce uh, line items in, in portfolio, in banks and other participants' portfolio. So, Taken all this into account and the importance of this technology, what was striking to us was the limited amount of research being done from you know, analytic research being done at understanding both the technology and its potential implication um, should it be widely adopted in markets. So that is so what we are what, what we are trying to do with this paper and what I'm trying to do today is basically building the first steps towards this understanding. So. More precisely, what I would love to do today is first introduce you to some of the fundamentals of the technology. So under which conditions can we observe um, uh, portfolio compression to be efficient? How much can it actually eliminate theoretically from a market? But also bring that to data and run a couple of exercises where, you, where we would uh, observe how much size can be eliminated and how much shrink can we, how much of the size can shrink should uh, participants uh, engage and agree to engage in different kinds of portfolio compression. And ultimately, um, I think the bottom line of all this is really to derive policy implications. I've listed a few of them. I'm pretty sure there are many others that uh, we haven't addressed yet. And I'll, I'll particularly look forward to Q&As on, on this last aspect. All right, so as I mentioned, what I was uh, illustrating the portfolio compression uh, mechanism, the first thing to have in mind here is that portfolio applies onto a market. So the first thing we need to understand is 
how is this redundancy represented in those markets that portfolio compression can exploit? So here, um, I want to illustrate how typical over-the-counter market look like. So this is uh, a map from real data. So this is credit default swap data um, in April 2016 of contract written on a European government reference. Um, and I tell you that the total size of this market is 16 billion. So now what you can observe from this map is that you typically have three types of three segments in the market. You have customers buying the contract, customers selling the contract, and then you have dealers in between that intermediate between those customers, but dealers also largely trade with and amongst each other. And so the first thing to, when we talk about this size, the first thing we want to know is how much of these 16 billion get distributed among these different segments. And so the answer is more than 95% of this total size gets concentrated into the intra-dealer segment. And the next thing is to understand how much of it is actually covered by net position and how much of it is redundant in the sense that it results from offsetting trades. And so for each of those segments, we compute the average net to gross ratio. And so what you find is naturally that the customers have a net to gross ratio of one because they're active on only one side. But for dealers, this net to gross ratio is on average equal to uh, 20%. So if you run a quick calculation, what this tells you is that out of those 16 billion, 20% of the 95%, 80% uh, of the 95% are actually resulting from uh, um, offsetting positions, offsetting trades. And these offsetting trades are generating this redundancy that we, ex that we want to exploit under this portfolio compression approach. So let me formalize the concept of redundancy through what we call notional excess. So notional excess in the market, and this is, I promise, the only uh, formula that I'm going to show today. So this um, excess in the market is going to be the difference between the market total size, so the gross notional of the market, and the minimum amount of notional that you require in the system in order to satisfy every market participant's net position. So as soon as this excess becomes positive, then it tells you that there is some, some, some trades that are offsetting each other, and so there is room for netting. And from this definition, what we extract is a result that tells us when can we observe positive excess. And the answer to this is quite straightforward. As soon as the market exhibits intermediation, you will have positive excess because this intermediary um, will generate these offsetting trades because its net position now, its net to gross ratio will be below one. And so that is also why over the counter markets, because they're so centered around dealership and intermediation, are particularly subject to um, being good candidates for portfolio compression. So now that we've expressed, let's say the objective function of portfolio compression, the second thing is to look at the constraint because obviously from the definition we gave before and this idea of multilateral netting, there are many other refinements that one can do and add uh, taking into account every participant's individual preferences. So here for sake of simplicity, we're simply going to consider two major benchmarks. On the one hand, we have one thing that we call the conservative compression approach. So in this case, what we assume is that participants are, will only accept compression solution that reduce or eliminate already existing contracts, but they will reject any solution that creates or suggests a new connection or a new trade with a counterparty that they were not trading with before. So they are conservative on their portfolio of relationships. And we contrast that with a non-conservative approach where here participants are, um, are indifferent with respect to the switch and change in the shuffling of their uh, counterparties. And the only thing that matters here is that we satisfy the constraint on the net balance. And finally, we have a third one that is basically a composite of the two other approaches where we say, okay, maybe dealers, for example, have uh, treat differently their, their relationship with customers than they, than they treat their relationship with other dealers. So with, dealer, with dealers with customers may not want to be cut off of their relationship because they've established it. And so they're going to apply a conservative compression there. Whereas in, inside the intra-dealer segment, we're basically assuming that they, in that case, that they form a rich club, which basically means that they all know each other. BNP Paribas is always trading with ING, Societe Generale and others. And so uh, uh, relationships can be switched and trades can be opened and closed at, at negligible cost. And so in the intraday segment, we apply non-conservative compression. So having all this into, taking all this into account, our two questions are, when can we use them and how much can they eliminate? So the feasibility condition and the efficiency condition. And so 
for the feasibility condition, the conservative case can only be applied to closed chains of intermediation. In contrast, the non-conservative case can be applied to any form of intermediation. And the reason for this is that um, whenever you want to compress a chain, you will have to create a new link. Typically here, you would have to create a new link between B and C. And so that would not satisfy the conservative constraint. So that puts a limit on how much conservative compression can be efficient. That gives us the second result on the efficiency, which says that in a typical dealer customer network, conservative compression will always leave out some excess. So there will always be some residual excess that cannot be compressed further through conservative compression. And the reason for this is that conservative compression can break open closed loop of intermediations, but it cannot go further. Whereas the non-conservative case can always eliminate all the excess in the market because it can always break down all of these chains of intermediation and end up with only buyers and sellers. And then the hybrid case just stands in between. And so what we observe from this exercise is simply that there's a, a trade-off that emerged between how conservative you want to be with respect to the already established relationship and how efficient you want to be at eliminating excess from the market. So this is a theoretical um, uh, inequality relationship, but what we really want to do and understand is how can we quantify this distance? And does this distance really determine whether we want to go conservative or not conservative? And so in order to do that, we move to data and we apply this framework to data. So we use data uh, collected under the European Market Infrastructure Regulation, where we collect all contracts, all credit default swap contracts, where at least one of the legs is based in Europe. And we look at all the single names uh, credit default swap contracts. We look at single names also because they're markets that still haven't fully adopted compression. So they're free of the adoption of, of compression. And we have a lot of more excess over there. And we basically look at them between 2014 and 2016, select the top 100 most traded instruments by reference entities and maturity so that they match and they, are quite, they remain quite fungible. And then for each of those markets separately, we compute the levels of excess to estimate actually how much is at stake. Uh, and then we basically design optimal algorithm solution for each of the benchmarks that I presented, implement them and see how efficient they can be with respect to each of those markets. Right? And the last thing we do in the paper is we also look at the interaction between portfolio compression and central clearing, but for sake of, of time, I'll, I'll, I'll skip this here, but I'm happy to discuss this um, in the Q&A as well. All right, so in terms of um, excess, what we find is that, so these are box plots of the statistic throughout these uh, 100 markets. What we find is that on average, more than 75% of the size of each of those markets is uh, relates to redundant trades in excess. So here the excess ratio is the excess of a market divided by the total size of the market. So three quarters of the 16 billion that I was mentioning before on average, or what this suggests is these three quarters apply to the 60 trillion CDS, 700 trillion uh, over the counter market in general, and the 16 billion that I presented before. Now the question is how much, so with respect to these different benchmarks that I mentioned, uh, how much can we actually um, eliminate of the excess? And so in order to do that, we look at efficiency in terms of how much excess is eliminated divided by how much excess was there in the first place. We don't show result for the non-conservative case because by virtue of the result I presented before, they always achieve 100% excess elimination. So what we end up with is conservative compression and hybrid compression. And what is striking, according to us in this result, is how efficient the conservative compression is. So in this case, again, the only thing we do is we, we tell customers, we, like the compression service provider, would only tell customers to eliminate or reduce already existing position, but is not disrupting the market any further by suggesting new links or new counterparty relationships. And in that case, the median and the, and the average of the efficiency is above 85%. And this is very stable over time. And then as soon as you start um, unlocking some of the constraints, so for example, moving from conservative to hybrid, then you obviously have some marginal gains in the efficiency. All right, so I see that time is running up. So let me conclude. Um, so, what, so here, what we really have in mind is the fact that over the counter markets are huge and very important to the economy, but that what we find is that they also generate large levels of excess. So on average, we find more than 75% of the total national being in excess, according to our definition of these offsetting trades. 
Excess can be removed by portfolio compression, which boils down to a coordinated mechanism that leads to rapid reduction in aggregate size. This demand on its own can explain part of the, 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 the jumps in reduction that we've observed in the market. And the, the demand for this technology is at the moment driven by the regulatory cost associated with excess. The reason why we observe such large capacity to eliminate excess in those markets is driven by the structure of those markets, which are tightly knit structure where a lot of the notion is concentrated among dealers and the dealers are highly connected with each other. So even the conservative compression can exploit a lot of the closed chains of intermediation to be very efficient. All right, so I see that I'm over time. I've listed a few policy implications that we believe are um, important with respect to our result. They relate to how the technology distorts aggregate assessment in terms of liquidity and inventory capacity, but also how it requires monitoring of risk redistribution from dealers to customers and need to harmonize incentives to participate from banks and non-banks. And finally, and that will be my closing point, uh, we believe also that there's a, a utility for the technology that goes beyond the private demand, which typically relates to cases like we have today, where uh, it could be used as a systemic risk management tool in order to alleviate sometimes part of the success that can be in market and help improve transparency and, and liquidity. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tariq. That was a very interesting and clear presentation. Please, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A and then I can uh, transmit them to uh, Tariq. But while people are doing that, let me ask a question or two, Tariq. So in your simple examples, you have um, these A, B, C, and you had A had a claim on B of five, so B had a claim on A of five and, and C on C of uh, 10. And then you had compression and then claim A had a claim on C of uh, 15, but you said nothing had changed except in terms of bankruptcy possibilities. So if you've got a claim on just one instead of on two, the bankruptcy implications are quite different. Now, of course, if, if it's a risk-free market, then that's not a problem. But as you, as you say, one of the interesting issues here is systemic risk. So could you explain how how these compression techniques work in terms of, of bankruptcy risk, and do we do you have to reprice the the uh, the contracts when you compress to take that into account? And if so, how do you do that, or what, what do you do? So that's an excellent question. Um, to be completely honest, there is part of this that uh, at the moment we don't know. So we are we are still so we've run a, a few interviews with with compression providers and compression participants. It's still unclear to us how compression affects pricing. So we believe this is like something that has to be understood further. But at the moment, it's it's unclear to me exactly how it would affect pricing. I do take so maybe we can we can go back to the example you mentioned. So if we Right, so this was the original situation where uh, B was expecting a, a payment of 20 from C and had to pay five to, uh, A had, was expecting a payment of 20 from C and had to pay five to B. And what we are saying is that this situation contrasts with this one where now A only expects 15 from C. Now, the, I think the, 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 the main intuition was that, would be that now, um, we've reduced credit counterparty risk, at least at the bilateral level, because we've eliminated part of the, or we've reduced part of what had to be repaid from each of those counterparties. What I take from your comment is that um, the fact that the, the, the shock could come from one counterparty or two uh, does have a role in how the, the contagion process can take place. Yes, that's, that's exactly right. So, you know, if, if C goes bankrupt, a now loses 15, or depending on how the, the bankruptcy court works. Mm -hmm. But in the previous one, they still have a claim on B, which would be um, five. So they'd, they'd be somewhat better off. Um, if, if, so they, in this case, if, if C goes bankrupt, they lose uh, 20, but they've still got a claim on, on B of five. 
Right. So, so uh, I'll, I'll be completely honest with you. Initially, what we really wanted to do was uh, to, to run these exercises and to have a better understanding. And that's what I mentioned at the end of the redistribution null effect um, that compression has. Um, what we realized was that we first had to build up all this understanding before we could um, uh, come into, in, into these, these aspects. And as you say, I think part of the legal aspects and the bankruptcy aspect that are involved with this technology remain quite opaque to us at the moment. The only thing I would say was, would be that this, I think, is the next question to be, to be answered based on of, of the framework we've built. Yeah, I think pricing would be a very interesting part of that. The, the next question I would have is related to that, which is bankruptcy laws, as I understand it, vary quite significantly across countries. And so in some countries you allow netting and in other countries you don't allow netting in bankruptcy. And one of the interesting things to do, as I understand it, this is a national issue, in terms of bankruptcy, it's not something that that the EU defines at the moment, and you, I may be wrong about that. But it would be very interesting to look at how country location of each of these dealers varies with, with uh, bankruptcy laws, and whether countries which have more netting had more of these kinds of uh, exposures, and countries with with, with less netting have less or the other way around. So I think there are a lot of interesting issues that you can, you can look at there. Frankly, and if this I, relates I... to your final slide. I mean, I think those, those final three things were very interesting uh, and you can do a lot more on, on this, these issues. Uh, just to add on, on what you just mentioned now, I think one way in which uh, portfolio compression is, is, is particularly specific, especially if you compare it, for example, with central clearing, is that it goes beyond netting at the, at the, at the payment flows. So basically, contracts are torn down and then they are rewritten. So um, I, I, my, my sense is that this has an effect on the dimension you're, 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 you're touching upon because the netting is embedded in the new rewriting of the contracts and it's not... Uh, expected to be uh, ex post negotiated because it's part of these new contracts that are being written. Whereas if we do netting just by computing, by netting cash flows, for example, instead of tearing down contracts, then I think this cash flow netting is more exposed to the, to, to the bankruptcy laws. That would be my intuition. Then whenever it's written within the, these new contracts. No, I think it's very, you know, those are very interesting areas to, to consider going forward. Let me um, start on some of the questions in the Q&A. So Carol Anu has um, the following question. Compression has thus become useful for supervisors for financial stability reasons, but what is the economic usefulness of these excesses? So if I understand correctly the question, um, the question is about why why are we observing this success and is there benefits from this success um, accrued yeah, to, so, the, to so the Carol, participants? Carol's arguing that it, it's useful for supervisors to understand these because then you get some insight into systemic risk. But but what's the economic efficiency gains from having these uh, having these excess? Why do they? I guess you know the market comes up with these enormous numbers that yeah. you documented very nicely of, you know, 80% is excess. Why, and you know, this is kind of a classic issue as to why do we have so many, you know, cross liabilities of this kind? What, why yeah. do they arise, do you think? I mean, you know, the, the obvious other way to do it is just do it through a central clearing party. And one of the big issues I think is why, why don't we, get a sort of a star system and you know when you look at the theoretical literature for uh, cross liabilities they usually come up or often come up with a solution that the optimal thing is to have a star so you have one one central one and then uh, hub and spoke system essentially but we don't observe that in practice what we observe is what you've documented and I, I think what Carol is asking is is why does it ride that way what's what's the economical mm -hmm. usefulness of these excesses so my, my, 
so, so this is not part of our model. So everything that I'm about to say now is more about intuition and, and global understanding. And I think that's related to the nature of how over the counter market work. So it, you know, we know over the counter market, you have this opacity in the system because you have to search for the right price. You have to search for the right trade whenever you want to trade something. And so you easily end up, and there's, there's quite a heavy literature on these asymmetric information problems, but you easily end up with chains of intermediation that go from the originator of the contract to the end buyer of the contract. And sometimes in the trade history, you may add up a few, a few more, let's say a few more hops until the, the trade finds its uh, risk buyer, for example. And so I think the, 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 the hops, Obviously, you would want to include many ingredients, but I think you know if you were to make everything, so if you were to deal better with information, then you would require less of these intermediation chain, which come from dealers. You know, you have these hot potato models, for example, which show that dealers take on trades because they need to offset one original trade, but then this trade can be offset with another one, and so based off of these different uh, layers of incentives and strategies, they end up with huge inventories, and so I think. A way in which uh, this is another insight that I can bring in is I think prior to the crisis and prior to the regulatory reform, um, dealers could afford to have these large inventory uh, inventories of positions with you know without caring. Um, and actually, when we talked with with one of the founder of Treptima, which started before the crisis, they said that between when they started in 2003 and the crisis, their service was seen from big banks as good housekeeping. It's really just like, okay, let's maintain things correctly. Let's redu reduce the number of line items, but th the benefit was not that big. What came through the crisis is that this inventory now cost more because you, they require larger sets of collateral and capital require and, and capital that you need to keep aside. And so now banks and other participants see value in reducing this because of the, basically it's the re regulation brought the demand for this, for this technology because it, it has imposed a cost on it. But back to your point, I think from what we were seeing before, the equilibrium was that actually there was no, not much need or, or desire to, to decrease the success or to deal with the excess. It was just taken on positions uh, as they came from demand from customers. Yeah, no, so that's, a, that's a very interesting answer. I think one of the things that would be good if you could document is the actual costs of these. I, mean, I think this is important aspect of Carol's question, what are the actual costs of this intermediation? So, you, you know, collateral is one, so you have to tie up collateral, but also, you know, presumably they're taking a spread as well. And, you know, if you've got a whole chain of these spreads, again, it seems somewhat inefficient relative to some kind of central system or star and spoken hub system. So I think there's a lot of interesting issues there. Let, let me move to the next question, which is Georg Ring. And what he asks is, what about the legal side of compression? Is this a innovation, simple netting? Is this recognized by all jurisdictions? What if some countries do accept this, but others not, in particular EU and non-EU? Yeah, so I wish Marco was here because he's much more versed in the legalities of it and he's been searching it with, together with the European Systemic Risk Board. Um, I think that's an, that's an open question. My feeling and my understanding is that um, uh, some of these issues are, are, are solved because um, those parts to Trioptima and other compression service providers like Air, L Market, et cetera, are able to do cross-country cross compression. What I think is important to keep in mind is that under European market infrastructure regulation, portfolio compression is actually uh, supported. So there is an ar article 14 um, suggests that when you, when you share more than 500 trades with, with a counterparty, you should, sh you should seek to terminate or to compress part of these, part of these trades. So there is an, uh, both in, in the US at least and in the EU, there is, a re there is at least a strong support to allow for this for this cross netting to take place. Um, now for the and, and I know some of the compression service providers are also working with developing economies, um, but my knowledge, you know, stops there. Um, I, the, the legal aspect is an important one, which uh, but I, I'm I'm not really versed there, unfortunately. 
So just just as a follow up to that, do, do you know what, you know, we, we, we look at debt contracts, they're typically mm -hmm. written under New York or uh, London law, and, and that's what is, is relevant. Is that true with these kinds of netting contracts? Or is it, anyway, this, this may be another a question for um, Marco, but um, do you know the answer to that? I, 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 I don't. Um, one issue um, that I can raise here, which is just mechanical and, and stems from analyzing this, but I guess, legally speaking, this will become a problem because ultimately you could think also of netting contracts that are not derivative. So you could start thinking of what happens if we can net a debt contract, uh, etc. One of the problems here is that compression and netting imposes implicitly a seniority between the trades that you're able to net out and the trades that you cannot net out. And so there is a big discussion, I think, that has to be had around whether we would allow this implicit scenario to take place or not. And I think typically for that contract, that would be a major problem. Um, but again, um, I, I, um, I'm afraid my knowledge about the, the legality aspect of, this, of the netting contract is, is again limited. Uh, it might be interesting to include a section, a short section in the paper, just discussing some of those issues. So uh, the next question is from uh, Cosmina Amariai. And what she asks is, is trade compression used for other types of OTC derivatives, for example, interest rate, foreign exchange, and so on? I guess that's referring back to your initial diagram where we, we saw the hundreds of uh, trillions of, of dollars of, of derivatives, you focused, or your data set is, is for CDS markets. Do you know what, how it works in other markets? Yes, so, so most of the over-the-counter large derivatives market, in particular, the most standardized one, so interest rate swaps, um, FX, et cetera, are uh, also subject to large um, uh, compression cycles in particular. So I think at the moment, the IRS is the most compressed one. Uh, the reason why in our exercise, we focused on CDSs was first, um, because that's where it really started. Then it, the, the, the large volume now are driven by other markets, but it really started with CDSs historically. And also because we believe they are the easiest one to interpret because you can e more easily translate what happens when you net out a CDS contract in terms of expected payments, in terms of potential defaults of the reference entity. And it's also easier to, to match maturities, et cetera, than, than other contracts. But in practice, uh, so you, for example, L Markets is um, specialized in FX, for example, they only do compression for FX. And then once you start entering the, the, the nitty gritty detail of each contract, then you can also, you, you get different flavors of compression. So what we presented here is quite generic. Then there's multiple ways in which you can optimize and additional ingredients that you can put in that are specific to some kind of derivative. But I invite you to, um, uh, to each of these compression service providers lists out the, the, the instruments in which they're involved. And um, for example, try optimize also into commodity, uh, commodity derivatives. Etc. So, so, so there are plenty of. It's a it's a booming field which is becoming very exotic. And are these companies profitable? <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, I would think so. Seeing, for example, so I think now uh, there are between four and five of them, and they are increasing. So, the four or five that I know of and that are um, in the markets. So, I, I would think they are and. Again, I think their, their business model has received a boom from the regulation. And without the regulation, and actually talking with people at Treoptima, you know, without the regulation, they would have to re reinvent themselves because uh, it's really this, this regulatory cause that is driving the demand for them. And, and do you know, if, how did you get your data? Did you, did they, you know, is, is it possible to get data from some of these other markets like the uh, interest rate swap market? So and this may be, I need to be, um, uh, so sometimes this is confusing. So let me clarify the exercise at least we run is not related to the data they have. The exercise we run is based on supervisory data. So what we observe is contracts from the actual markets and we run a, a scenario where we assume that every participant wants to compress and then we do the compression as a service provider would do. 
So what we do not observe is the actual statistics from service providers. Um, however, I think Trioptima now, they, they, they have um, a database that, well, it's very aggregate, but provides um, uh, per, we need to double check, but Trioptima does provide per asset how much and in which country, how much of, of notional they're able to eliminate. So it, it, it's a little bit more uh, granular than the, just the 1.8 uh, quadrillion dollars of notional that I showed. Um, but yeah, so, so the exercise we run is a little bit different uh, because presumably we have more information than they do because they have the, inf it's a network business. So they have information from their own clients. We observe the full market. And so our, our, our exercise is rather on an estimation of what would happen if everyone was to converge onto one service provider and accept, for example, a conservative compression. And so potentially you can get data from, from the supervisors on, on many of these other markets then. Right. And in the, in the recent revisions of the regulatory, regulatory standards um, of, uh, of, of these supervisory data, there is actually now a lot more information on the trades that results uh, from compression exercises. So you can start becoming a little bit more specific, specific here. What is really hard to manage ultimately, and that's, that's just the nature of it, is it's hard to reconstruct the compression trade history. So you can observe whether a, a contract is the result of a compression, but it's hard to know which contracts were involved into the creation of that new contract. So the tractability of the impact of compression over the market is, is uh, non-trivial. So you don't have a dynamic data set then, you've got a... Well, I mean, I did want to, to know exactly where it started and then how it evolved right. time. You don't have that. You have I a snapshot. The data, the, the data we were using did not have that. I know that there's a lot of efforts being done, uh, at least in Europe. And there was a, um, a, a call for comment at ESMA on trying to understand better how to, which makes sense in general, is how to better supervise post-trade activities and changes, both in, in clearing and non-clearing, netting and not netting, et cetera. How do we better uh, monitor what is happening there? And I think it's ultimately, it's a hard question to address because then, you know, the, the, sometimes it's a little bit of a black box. Sometimes you, your, your new contracts pop out from such a complex interaction of uh, multilateral um, interdependent contracts that it will be hard to, to establish. And, and j j you may have already have said that, Mr. which I apologize, but my understanding from your answer so far is you don't have pricing data. Is that correct? So you have prices about the contracts. Um, however, I think an interesting exercise, though complicated, would be to tease out how the changing contracts can only be attributed or what part of the changing contract is attributed to the netting dimension. Um, and that again, I think would depend on the type of contract, et cetera. This is an exercise we haven't done, but that would typically go in, in I think back to your initial question into trying to assess at least empirically how um, these services change uh, affect prices, yes. Okay, now that's very interesting. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? Perhaps uh, I have a question, Franklin. Uh, go, go ahead, Apostolos. Yes, uh, thanks, Tarek, for the presentation. Uh, you mentioned liquidity. Uh, what is the impact of compression to liquidity? How liquidity is affected? And mm -hmm. does this affect also investors? Yes, so, so that's the, that's basically, I'm borrowing from the argument of, um, of Daryl Duffy, uh, which where basically he says, one of the problems that we saw with the increase of um, so I'm, I'm using Daryl's ar argument and then I'm contrasting this with what you can infer from looking at these large drops, right? Because if you look at these large drops in size and you interpret them as a drop in activity or, or some participant leaving the market, then you may infer that you, you may want to, to come to the conclusion that you, know, you have less dealers there and dealers are less willing to take on positions, so liquidity has decreased. Whereas if this size drops because dealers are freeing up their inventory, well, basically that would mean that they might be ready to take on new positions. And so they, that would increase the liquidity in those markets because there was so much uh, provisioning that was not possible because they had to keep all this capital inside uh, because of the regulatory requirement computed on their, the size of their inventory, um, of their inventory 
um, for each each of these dealers. Um, yeah, so I think that relates exactly to, to, to what I wanted, wanted to claim here. It's really this, there's a possibility if you don't take this into account of a, a distortion in the liquidity view of those markets. Um, and ultimately the, the real, I think what is important to be done there is really to distinguish what happens pre-trade and post-trade. And like those, the problem is that those post-trade technology, if they are confused for any pre-trade uh, dynamics can become confusing. Any more questions from anybody? Okay, well with that, thank you very much Tariq. Tariq thank you Franklin. Good luck with, with this paper and extend or further research on I think it's a very interesting area. And uh, it's great that you're, you're considering those and congratulations again on, on winning the uh, best paper award. Thank you very much, Franklin. Thank you very much for the comments. Thank you everyone for uh, all the feedback. This is indeed, there are indeed many ways in which we should improve our paper or at least extend the research. So this is all very welcome. Um, and we're both very grateful to the, to the award and to the opportunity to present here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Apostolos. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. But before closing, I mean, of course, uh, you received the best paper, so we should give you the prize. Uh, so I, I will ask my uh, colleague there to display uh, the kind of certificate uh, to you and also Marco for your excellent work. And once again, uh, thank you very much. Thank Interesting you. paper. Uh, I would also want to mention that the paper will become available probably at the beginning of next week as a ECMI working paper. So you would be able to access the paper via the ECMI uh, website. And uh, once again, thank you very much, Tariq and Franklin. Thank you. Thank you.